Hi, this is Usha. Welcome to Rathod's IS classes. Today in this lecture, we are going to see current affairs of 11th April 2022. So let's get started with our lecture. So there are many things to be done. I think video will be lengthy. So without wasting any time, let's get started with our discussion. And let us try to see today's quote. So today's quote is given by Abdul Kalam. So according to this quote, he mainly says that you can't change your future but you can change your habits and surely your habits will change your future so if you want to change your future first of all you have to change your habits right so you can't change your future but you can change your habits and finally these habits will change your future and i think this will be giving you a boost to improve at least one hour of your preparation today right so now let us try to see first topic. Actually, this topic is important from your international relations point of view. So this title mainly says that India's role in disordered world. So now we need to talk about so what are the problems that we are facing geopolitically. And now we need to understand what is the role of India. So why this role of India is in news? So actually this topic which is mainly talking about this G20. Right. So actually what happened here? So here mainly the countries which mainly decided to throw Russia out of this G20. But China says no. So why? Why we need to talk about India's role? Because from December 2022 onwards, so India which is mainly going to chair this G20. So because of this, we need to talk about what is the role of India in this G20. So this topic is very important from your international relations and we need to understand some geopolitical scenarios that are happening, right? So what happened now? Why it is in news? Now, Western countries. So Western countries, they want to throw this Russia out of G20. But we already know China and Russia, they are friends. And China and Russia, they are members of this G20. And China says that, no, no, we are not going to accept this. But if you're talking about India's role, so India it is going to chair this G20 summit from December 1st, 2022 onwards. So here we need to talk about role of India. So first of all, let us try to see some facts regarding G20. So without knowing this G20, so if I explain all these things will be, you might be confused, right? So first we need to know what is this G20 and which are the countries which are members of this G20 because you can get a question in your prelims regarding, they will be giving you some countries and ask you to Identify which are the following countries are part of G20. So in this context, we need to know countries of G20 as well. So what is this G20? G20 it is an informal group. And this G20 mainly contains 19 countries along with European Union. Overall, we are having 20, right? So if we're talking about this G20, why it is very important? Because if you're talking about the members of this G20, they include Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, Indonesia, India, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey, United Kingdom, United States and European Union. So you might be having confusion ma'am, you are just reading these uh, countries. So how can we remember those countries? So for this I will be giving you a tip. So try to take the world map, okay? I also had remembered these countries through this technique only. So take the world map and try to see which are the countries which part of this G20 from specific continent. For example, which are the countries which are coming from North America. So countries from South America, countries from Europe, countries from Africa, countries from Asia like that. So that you can remember in this way, okay? So in North America, which are the countries part of G20? and South America, which are the countries of G20. So you might be also knowing about the countries or political maps of these continents, right? So you have to remember the countries, right? So if you remember so-and-so country, which is part of uh, North America, which is part of this G20 means you can easily identify. So if any other country, which is other than the member, which is given in that options means you can easily eliminate that. So in this technique, you can easily remember the members of this G20. So try it today. So at least you spend one hour of time and you, you can easily remember these countries without any difficulty. So if you're talking about these G20 countries, which is having most populated countries, 
right for example china is part and india is part and even we can see us is also part russia is also part australia is also part so what happens so because of this we can see it is the world's largest advanced and emerging economies so it is country it is containing both developed and as well as developing countries like india so it is the world's largest advanced and emerging economies and these countries they also represent two thirds of our world's population and about 85 percentage of this gross domestic product of the world and even 80 percentage of the global investments and even 75 percentage of this global trade so because of this this t20 which is having a very large significance and now let us try to see here so we are having number of institutions of global governance okay so these institutions of international importance they mainly fail to unite the world right and now we are facing global climate crisis and even we face a struggle because of this COVID-19 crisis. And in this COVID-19 crisis, WTO and as well as WHO, they lost their significance. We discussed about that lossing of significance of WHO, that is World Health Organization, in our COVID-19 response. Right. So due to this COVID-19, we came up with this vaccines. Actually, developed countries, they have technology and they have production units. They went for producing of large amount of vaccines. And developed countries, they gave the two doses of the vaccines and they gave the booster dose. And now they are mainly talking about another precaution dose as well. So whenever we are talking about vaccines, which are mainly hoarded by rich countries in this COVID-19 pandemic, so because of this poor countries, especially developing countries and as well as least developed countries, they mainly starved because of this vaccines. And if you are going towards African countries, they didn't have even single dose of complete vaccination to their people. Right. So in this way, we can see vaccine inequality that is widely prevalent between developed and as well as developing and even developed countries. And if you are talking about WTO, it mainly talked about waiver regarding this uh, COVID-19 vaccine, but it didn't include it regarding this drugs which are mainly useful to treat this COVID-19. Right, so here we can see there is inequitable access to this COVID-19 vaccine during this COVID-19 period and it is mainly because of frozening of global supply chains. And now what happened in 2020 to February, now we are facing another crisis because of this Russia-Ukraine war. Okay, so because of this Russia-Ukraine war that is having some impacts on global economy as well. Right, so we are talking about undemocratic architecture that is present. So during the second world war, so during the second world war, number of countries, they mainly participated. And due to the second world war, millions of civilians, they lost their life. Right, and finally the second world war, which mainly ended by dropping of nuclear bombs on Japan and that led to smashing of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan and because of this nuclear bomb that led to killing of thousands of civilians in these two cities and that led to wiping out of these two cities and if you're talking about new institutions for this global governance so we came up with this GATT okay that is general agreement on tariffs and trade and we also came up with World Bank and IMF that is International Monetary Fund so these are the institutions who are mainly focusing on public finance they are mainly focusing on public finance and they are mainly trying to build the economies of all the countries especially to eliminate poverty and if you're talking about imf it will be giving you loans whenever you are facing this bop that is balance of payment crisis right so this balance of payment crisis it is one of important chapter under your economy that comes under your static syllabus right so if i talk about this bop entire class like i will be taking like 30 to 40 minutes entirely to talk about this bop so please refer about this bop in your ncrt of your economy okay so if you're talking about in the second world war who are the winners right we know that five p5 members that is permanent five members and whenever we are talking about this united nations security council so we are having permanent members and as well as non-permanent members as members of this unsc so you might be knowing we have 15 members and out of this five members are p5 members and 10 are non-permanent members and these p5 members who are winners or victors so they had veto power within this united nations security council right so whenever united nations security council which is mainly passing any resolution 
okay regarding nuclear power or anything what happened some of so many a times so these p5 countries they will be holding this veto power and these victors they are also controlling world bank imf and as well as world trade organization as well so if you are talking about another important organization that is our united nation general assembly so simply we can call as unga so unga which mainly meets every year and there are now as of now there are 193 nations they are the members of this united nation general assembly and this united nation general assembly which is having a function like to pass the resolution for example it will be talking about different areas like global problems per se hunger poverty women's right terrorism climate change etc here okay and if you are talking about this members of this united nation security council they retain their right right to deny okay even sometimes the members in this united nation general assembly they are not going to give their vote that is they will abstain from their vote and some people they will be voting against the resolution some people they will be voting in favor so this is the thing we saw in recent resolution regarding this russia ukraine crisis as well so india mainly abstain from the vote right so if we are talking about some more important facts which are given in this article it mainly says that so actually first of all g7 which mainly formed in year 1976 so after this g7 which is converted into g8 so from this g7 russia which mainly added right and finally this russia which is mainly removed from this g8 okay because of russia which mainly annexed or occupied crimea so after russia's annexation of crimea in 2014 russia expelled from this g8 and now it is again become g7 so if you are talking about which are the countries part of this g7 so this is also very important we have us <clears throat> we have us we have uk france italy japan west germany and canada so they formed this g7 organization in 1976 and they will be mainly focusing on economic related issues for example inflation and o o e opec that is organization of petroleum exporting countries and later on they uh, they mainly invited russia and that led to formation of this g8 so what happened after g8 which mainly formed in 2014 russia annexed crimea and after that russia which is mainly thrown out of this g8 so if you are talking about there is a rapid spread of a uh, global finance and as well as trade after the victory of uh, washington census in 1991 okay so that led to mainly creation of instabilities in developing countries and after asian financial crisis g20 was formed in 1999 and the important aim of this g20 which is mainly formed for the discussing of policies mainly to achieve international financial stability so this g20 which is mainly focusing on maintaining of international financial stability so this is the one important thing you have to remember and finally author says that there is a need of redistribution of power right so power which mainly accumulated in the society by principles of cumulative causation so on this principle of this cumulative causation we can see the power which mainly accumulated in the society okay so in this uh, theory of this cumulative causation we can see the greater wealth which is mainly accumulated okay and they and those countries are becoming powerful and they are having more education okay and they having power and with that power they want uh, they do not want to improve any rules of the game here okay and they want to ensure that they remain powerful in the society so if you are talking about the redistribution of this power within society so here in this redistribution we need to focus on redistribution of wealth redistribution of education and even we need to go for decentralization of source of power as well so here in this context here author mainly says that so what are the violence that we are seeing because of the power okay so because of this power we can see that is leading to violence so whenever we need to focus on redistribution of this power means we need to end the violence first and we need to prevent the violence so we need to go for a global governance global governance is very very essential and that global governance should be democratic and countries must not attack each other okay and but the countries they need to be given the freedom to evolve their own democracies and national well economies and it should not be dictated by any other country so one country should not dictate any other country 
okay such that we can ensure autonomy is given to so and so country and we can go for ending of violence and that will be having good impact on the global economy so we can ensure financial stability of those countries okay so this is the thing which mainly said by author so now let us try to see next article that is regarding care economy so getting serious about supporting the care economy so what is care economy for example if you are taking a housewife housewife will be taking care of their children and she will be doing work like cooking bathing clean, keeping house clean and she will be sending his husband and as well as children uh, he, she, she will be sending husband for the office and she will be sending children for the schools and after returning and she will be doing care okay even for the elderly people like husband's mother and father that is mother in law and father in law will be there in house so for those elderly people she will be also doing some care right so this all thing will become another this care economy so one important thing which is mainly excluded from our gdp so even in our counting of this gross domestic product so this care care work which is done by women which is not included so in this way we can say that this care economy which is mainly unpaid normally it is unpaid and it will comes under informal economy so if if some people they are mainly doing this care work for example i can talk about the maids who are present in the houses they will be working right so they will be also doing some care care work so this care work which is also comes under the informal economy right so here this article it is mainly talking about so whenever we are including this care economy and whenever we are accounting to our gdp that will leads to improving of economy and even we can say that will be creating lots of lots of millions of jobs in the world right so this is about this uh, introduction regarding this topic actually this topic is important regarding your gs paper 3 and economy so let us now try to understand this topic in a very great detail so we are talking about whenever there is a greater investment that is seen in this care services that can create an additional 300 million jobs globally so if you want to create the job uh, jobs we need to go for setting up of factories or we can go for setting up of manufacturing units like that so in the same way we can also create jobs in this care economy as well so in this care economy the jobs will be given for the women so whenever the women they are getting this jobs in this care economy then they will be financially independent okay so that will leads to empowerment of women as well so whenever they are becoming financial empowerment then the wide range of opportunities that are present before the women so in the most of the cases i studied one report that so why if women are facing domestic violence so even though they are facing torture in their house they are not coming outside to give complaint in the police station and they don't want to come out of that family and they don't want to break that bond because one important reason here is they are financially not independent they are financially dependent on their husbands so it is a one important reason here so whenever if you want to increase the quality of life of women so that women should be financially independent so how they can be independent because there is a high chances of increasing of employment rates and to generate about 300 millions of job globally for the women in this care economy right so if you are talking about female labor force participation so it is a very very low okay so in this way whenever we are creating opportunities for women in this uh, care economy means that will be helpful to increase female labor force participation and that will be helpful to achieve our sustainable development goal 8 which is mainly talking about promote sustainable inclusive and suitable economic growth and full and productive employment decent work for all so in this sustainable development goal of 8 that can be achieved whenever we are mainly increasing female labor force participation and if you are talking about international women's day so every year we celebrate this international women's day on march 8 so on this day we mainly talk about contributions of women to all spheres right so particularly we can also talk about the care work so but this care work it is it is like a paid or unpaid work and we need to also talk about the important opportunities that we are going to get whenever we are focusing on this care economy so it will be like a future for the decent work for women so if you are talking about care work so what it all includes for example feeding a baby or nursing an ill partner and we are mainly doing some indirect care activities like cooking cleaning so whether this work it is paid or unpaid or direct or in indirect so this is a very very vital for the human well being so for the well being of human this care work it is very essential and even for the economies of the countries
right so we are talking about unpaid care work which is mainly linked to labor market inequalities okay so here because of this we need to focus on policy implementation policy formulation and adequate attention to this policy formulation regarding this care work and if you are talking about paid care works for example we can talk about domestic workers and even anganwadis in india they are mainly struggling for access to the rights and as well as entitlements in the workers especially in our state there was some movement that is happening uh, from this anganwadis anganwadis they are doing some strikes mainly to uh, access their rights and as well as entitlements so in this way whatever the care work that is mainly done by these domestic workers and anganwadis in india they are also struggling to access rights and as well as entitlements as workers if you are talking about importance of the care work it is now widely acknowledged and it is also covered in various international commitments for example i can talk about sustainable development goals i can talk about international labor organization center uh, declaration so actually this year to commemorate this international women's day so international labor organization which also brought out some new reports so the report here which mainly talks about care at work investing in the care leave and as well as service for a more gender equal work of world so it is mainly talking about care leave for example if you are talking about maternity leave paternity leave it is mainly talking about and even it is talking about services for more gender equal work uh, equal work so if you are talking about this international labor organization which is only three party in this united nation agency which is mainly bringing together governments and as well as employees workers in 187 member states and it is mainly focusing to to set the standards okay it is mainly focusing to set the standards and to develop some policies and to devise a programs which are mainly focusing to promote decent work for all men and women okay so this is a united nations agency that is international labor organization which is mainly bringing together governments employers workers of 187 member states and they are coming up with implementation or to come up with some labor standards so what are the standards they need to follow and to develop some policies and to devise programs promoting decent work for women and as well as men and if you are talking about the highlights of that report it is mainly giving importance for the maternity paternity and special care leave so maternity leave means what is this maternity leave so whenever a woman becomes pregnant means at the time of delivery okay before some months she need the rest okay that is maternity leave and after delivery also uh, she will be having some post uh, delivery uh, delivery anxiety will be there stress will be there to recover from that also so there is a need of some time for the woman to recover and if you are talking about paternity leave so i think uh, i think you might come across this paternity leave because uh, our uh, cricketer that is kohli kohli cricketer who mainly applied for this paternity leave after the delivery of her wife actually okay so at that time this paternity leave was highly in news so paternity leave means nothing but father also will apply for the leave especially to give some support for the mother do after the delivery okay during the delivery or after the delivery okay so this is the, some important highlights of this report so this report also demonstrates that workplace that provides a time and this place will be also providing some income security and it is also focusing on space for undertaking care services for example breastfeeding and enable some positive nutrition for the faster recovery of women and even regarding the health outcomes so we need to focus on bridging of these gaps in current policies and we need to provide some proper services and we need to provide elderly care services that will mainly benefits this child development and aging people or elderly people and they can ensure a proper and dignity life so in this way it will be also generate more and better employment opportunities especially for women so we are talking about maternity leave or child care so maternity leave it is a universal human and labor right but actually it is not much fulfilled across all the countries in some countries they do not provide this maternity leave so here because of this here millions of the workers with the family responsibilities 
without adequate protection and as well as support. So whenever the country which is not giving maternity leave means that will be having some additional burden on this pregnant woman. So because of this, what happened pregnant women, they need to go for stop uh, doing their work, especially domestic workers. So because of this, what happened, there will be increasing of family responsibilities and they do not have proper adequate protection and as well as support, even nutrition will be not available for the women in some below poverty line families. And if you're talking about, especially in India, yes, we are offering 26 weeks of maternity leave. And if you're talking about international labor organization standards, it mainly mandates about 14 weeks of maternity leave. But in India, we are providing 26 weeks. But there is one loophole. So this 26 week, it is not given to each and every woman. So women who are working in this former employment, they will be getting this leave. So what about the women who are working in this informal employment, they will be not getting this leave. So this is also one loophole that we are mainly seeing. So if you are talking about pay, uh, paternity leave, okay, paternity leave means father leave. So father leave is also recognized as enabled for both mothers and fathers to better balance the work and family responsibilities. So whenever father who is getting leave means whenever woman had uh, her delivery means, so she will be not able to do the work. So at that time, whenever father who is staying along with her, his wife means, so there will be the better balancing of work and even that will be helpful for better balancing of family responsibilities as well, right? And this will be also helpful for the access to the quality and the affordable care services. For example, we need to focus on child care. We need to focus on elderly care and care for people who are with disabilities. It is a one of a challenge workers with family responsibilities face globally. So apart from this maternal leave and as well as paternal leave, we need to also focus on this child care services and this care services which are which not only includes as a child care, but we can also talk about elderly care, care for the people who are with disabilities as well. So in this way, we can say that in this care economy, we have a scope for improvement in availability, improvement in accessibility, affordability and as well as quality of quality of services and we need to go for improving of working conditions of these care workers so what are the critical gap is there so we need to address those gap okay so if you're talking about domestic workers who are working in houses so they are facing many challenges regarding decent work so because of this especially if you're talking about what are the issues they mainly faced during this uh, coronavirus pandemic time so they do not have proper social or health protection measures and even many people they lost their work. So if we're talking about data regarding how many domestic workers are present in India. So according to this government of India 2019 estimate, it mainly says that 26 lakh of this 39 lakh domestic workers in India are female. So there are 39 lakh domestic workers are there out of this 26 lakh work women. So you can understand what is the contribution of female in this domestic workers. Right. So as of now, government also came up with some laws which mainly focus on decent work for this uh, domestic workers like sexual harassment at women at workplace act and government also came up with this minimum wage schedule in many states. So they are mainly focusing on providing of decent work for these domestic workers. So we need to go for recognizing of these care workers and we need to promote decent work for all including domestic and as well as child care workers. It is also very much necessary especially to achieve our sustainable development goal. So if you are talking about how much India is spending, India is mainly spending less than 1% of our GDP on this care economy. Okay, so this is the one important data regarding how much India is spending on this care economy. So therefore, finally, we need to come up with the strategy and we need to come up with the policies that need to improve this uh, care economy and we need to provide some care service provisions for the decent working conditions for these care workers. So even International Labour Organization also proposes 5R framework for ensuring decent work. Okay, so those 5 R's are the first one is recognition, second one is reduction, third one is redistribution and fourth one is rewarding care. Okay, and finally representation in the social dialogue. So these are the five R's which are mainly come up by this ILO. So this will be very important whenever you are writing your mains answer. So finally, so we need to come up with proper investment and we need to come up with proper policy formulation, policy implementation such that we can support this care economy. Okay, so this is our topic. And now let us try to see next topic. It is regarding 
RBI policy. So recently we studied that RBI monetary policy decision which is mainly came up and it mainly said that they are going for this accommodative policy again. So this article is important in your GS paper 3 from your economy point of view and this will be important from your both prelims and as well as mains. So now let us try to understand this topic in a very great detail. So if you see context, it mainly says that in this bi-monthly monetary policy statement, the RBI said that we are not going to change any policy rates. So here we are going to come up with accommodative policy once again. So if you are talking about what is this monetary policy? So many students are new to this platform and many of you might not start economy till now, right? So for those people, so from RBI, so it is having monetary policy. From government side, we have physical policy. So this monetary policy and physical policy, they mainly focus on inflation. So whenever inflation is happening, so what are the steps that are taken by the RBI under this monetary policy to control this inflation? So it mainly comes under this monetary policy. And what are the steps that are taken by the government to control this inflation that mainly comes under this fiscal policy? So this monetary policy, which is mainly talking about whether increasing of money supply in market or to decrease money supply in market okay so whenever increasing of money supply means what happens so people will be having much much money in their hands so that they will go to market and they will go for demanding of goods and services that will helpful for economic recovery so whenever money supply if it is decreasing means what happen so whenever money supply means decreasing in the market means so people have not much money so that that will be controlling inflation okay so to increase this money supply and to decrease this money supply it will be focusing on this policy rates okay so that is about this monetary policy so monetary policy is nothing but macroeconomic policy actually it is mainly led by our central bank that is rbi in case of india so if we're talking about policy impacts the size and as well as the growth of the economy it is mainly focusing on inflation growth and unemployment in the country so what is the important objective of this monetary policy? It is to maintain price stability in the market. It is, it is mainly focusing on maintaining of this price stability in market. So this is one important objective of this monetary policy. So these monetary policies, they are implemented through different tools. For example, it mainly focusing on interest rates, purchase and sale of government securities, and even changing the amount of cash circulating in the economy. So these are the some important tools of monetary policy so we're talking about what are the details in our yesterday's article so we studied that the recent monetary policy committee report of rbi which mainly decided to keep policy that is a accommodative policy accommodative policy stand and they said that they are not going to change the repo rate so the repo rate will be four percentage and this is the thing that we are seeing from the 11th time so this is the 11th time we are seeing there is no changing of our repo rate so that is mainly seen whenever okay that is mainly seen since covid 19 which entered into our life okay so an accommodative credit policy stands means nothing but a central bank will cut the rates to inject money into the financial system so if we're talking about rbi projections on growth and inflation so the external developments so because of this external developments that is happening from the past two months so that led to downside of our domestic growth outlook so because of this geopolitical conditions that are mainly seen that led to increasing of this crude oil prices and that led to increasing of this commodity prices. So there is inflation like situation that is mainly seen in India. So not only India but almost all the countries are facing this inflation like conditions. So because of this here recently RBI came up with this uh, growth projections of 2022 to 2023 it is from 7.25 percentage okay earlier it projected that it will be like 7.8 percentage and now it said that it will be like 7.25 percentage right so this is the thing which mainly said in this article and now let's try to see next topic it is regarding architecture so the best chance for architecture so in this architecture field so what are the changes that we are going to come up with this national education policy that is the thing which mainly discussed in this article so this article will be important from your education point of view which mainly comes as gs paper 2 and i will try my level best to make you understand this topic 
So the national education policy is the best chance to set right architecture education. So it is mainly talking about architecture education. So if you are talking about context here, so recent documents which mainly give a sense of how national education policy will play a professional education especially in the field of architecture. So recently recent documents which are mainly released under this, we are mainly going to understand how this national education policy, which is mainly going to have some changes in this architecture education. So here, if you are talking about this architecture education, in this NEP, that is national education policy, which is mainly focusing on four recommendations regarding this architecture education. So first one is, it is mainly saying that there is a need of close connection between education and profession. So there is a need of link between profession and as well as education. So we should not treat them as isolated bodies, but there is a connection between this profession and as well as education. And this national education policy, which mainly directs this professional bodies such as Council of Architecture to set the standards. So here this national education policy, which is mainly asking this Council of Architecture to set the standards that have to met by the education. Okay. And it mainly through the uh, commencing in the campus, it, it will be mature in practice. So we need to come up with what are the challenges that we are facing and we need to come up with the standards to meet that challenges. So in this way, we will be having relationship between profession and as well as education. And second important recommendation here is undergraduate courses should be liberal. So what are the undergraduate courses that we are getting? So that courses should be liberal and we need to allow the students to be trained and that will be helpful for identification of their paths. So whether they have to go for jobs or whether they have to go for research, that will be helpful, especially when we are focusing on liberal undergraduate courses. And third one is unlike the current model that mainly trains only professional apprentice. So now this national education policy, which is mainly enables the students to take either practice or a research route. So whatever the current model it is present, so we are mainly coming out of that current model and we are mainly focusing whether to practice, whether we are giving chances or choices for the students, especially to make them whether they have to go for practice or whether they have to go for research route. So in this way, that will be helpful for paying, paving, uh, paving a way for diverse programs and even that will be helpful to support research training as well. And the fourth and last important pillar here is autonomy will be given to institution. So whenever autonomy is given to institution, that will save them from stifling regulatory arrangements and also that will be helpful for standardized programs also. So now let us try to understand what are the issues now we are facing in this ar architecture education. So actually this architecture, it is a five year course. Normally engineering course will be like four years of course. After that, we are going for doing of masters. So whenever there is a longer course means normally the justification is like whenever the course is long and rigorous course means that will be also including some important uh, skills so that after coming out of this course after out of this longer course then the professional ready students will be made right so the assumption is that longer the course the better the training is four years but what happens if after coming outside they will be not having proper skills that are required by the com by the industry so there will be not there will be not having much adequate support from the industry connections so because of this on one side the course is long the time is wasted and there is a high investment that is done here so that will also leads to heavy additional expenses so after completing this course of five years again they need to go for taking some training or do some other courses that will lead to additional expenses here so here because of this whatever the education that you are having that is having a very very less scope and even diverse specifications or not equipping the students to solve the complex design problems so because of this now NEP that is national education mission which is mainly focusing to restructure this undergraduate education and it should be a three years course and it should be liberal broad based education bodies that should be present and whenever we are having shorter programs that can build sufficient capacities to work with apprentices in industries as well. So after they complete this three years course, they can also do separate specialization. Okay, then they will be getting some work experience. So in this way, we are going to clear some of the issues which we are facing in this architecture education through this national education policy. So this is about this topic. 
and now let us try to see next topic it is regarding no confidence vote in pakistan so this topic is important from your gs paper to under polity and even this will be important from your international relations point of view so for the fourth time in a week pakistan will awake to possibility of new prime minister being chosen by national assembly so the national assembly of pakistan it is going to choose a new prime minister okay so because of this this is a news and if you are talking about what is the background so imran khan who is present prime minister he is facing no confidence motion against him okay that is nothing but no trust vote in pakistan against this prime minister so prime minister is facing no confidence motion by the opposition parties because he is majorly accused of economic mismanagement economic mismanagement so if you are talking about some facts regarding this no confidence motion in pakistan under the constitution of pakistan prime minister election is done by majority of lower house of its national assembly and the house which mainly has 342 members so if you see the half okay so any candidates mainly needs 172 of legislator votes to become the prime minister of the country so and the same members and the same number of votes which is also required for the vote against him regarding this no confidence motion as well so even one vote which is less than this 172 votes that means prime minister can be saved from this no confidence motion so these are the some important facts and now let us try to see next topic is regarding a non place so actually this topic is important from the students who are from this anthropology related optional so here we are focusing on what is this non place that's it okay so if you are talking about non place so why it is in use because of introduction to an anthropology of super modernity so here anthropologist he mainly talked about non places non places are nothing but a temporary spaces that thrive under capitalism so these places which mainly includes holiday resorts hotel chains and as well as supermarkets supermarkets hotel chains and holiday resorts they will comes under this non places and they are temporary spaces actually so even some spaces like refugee camps shanty houses torn down settlements they will also comes under this non places and this non places which mainly identifies temporary identities okay and these places they mainly exist in relation to specific ends such as transport commerce etc here so as the world contemplates it return to pre covid norms so now we are mainly focusing on this non places so earlier during this covid 19 time we have many restrictions there is no proper movement so at that time social movements uh, social uh, gatherings are very very less and moving out for the resorts to chill also less so now because of relaxation of this uh, covid 19 times now again there is increasing of prominence that is mainly seen for this non spaces okay so this is about this topic and now let us try to see next topic already this video it has been very very lengthy i also crossed my time limit right so let us fast let us try to see this topic also so bengal coast faces most erosion bengal coast faces most erosion so this article is important from your environment and ecology so if you see context it mainly says that the ministry of earth sciences in response to a question he mainly said that yes bengal coast which mainly eroded 34 percentage of um, of coast of uh, coast which is mainly having some varies or uh, varies uh, varying degrees of erosion so here ministry of earth sciences he mainly asked one question lok sabha so in this uh, question he mainly said that about 39 34 percentage of our india's coastline which is having erosion so here the details if you are talking about details it mainly says that the national center for coastal research chennai mainly attached office to this ministry of earth sciences it is mainly monitoring the shoreline erosion since 1990 and it is mainly using some remote sensing data and even gis okay gis mapping techniques and finally it's it is mainly monitoring this uh, shore lines so about 6907.18 km of indian coastline mainland has been analyzed from 1990s to 2018 and if you see the details it mainly says that so west bengal which is located in the eastern coast of the country about 65 60.5 percentage of erosion that is mainly seen and kerala 46.4 percent erosion tamil nadu 42.7 percent erosion gujarat 27.06 percent erosion and puducherry 56.2 percent of erosion so please see the data and i will be giving this data in the pdf in telegram channel 
and the ministry also said that 15th finance commission had recommended the creation of national disaster risk management fund and state disaster risk management fund which is mainly comprising a mitigation fund at national and as well as state levels so if you're talking about what can be the measures can be taken so you can write according to 15th finance commission it recommended for creation of this national disaster risk management fund and state disaster risk management fund so it is it should be mainly focusing on the mitigation measures for the prevent of uh, for the preventing of this erosion so this is the thing which mainly said in this article and now let us try to see these questions of yesterday so first question is regarding harappan pottery harappan pottery represents the blending of ceramic tradition of baluchistan and the cultures of east of indus system yes painted decoration of uh, pottery consists of horizontal lines of varied thickness and palm birds and animals people tree yes this is also correct so correct option will be both one and two and next question is regarding later vedic economy so pastoralism is the main subsistence activity is not pastoralism but they mainly came up with the cultivation so pastoralism it is not the main subsistence activity in this later vedic economy so first statement is incorrect so people of later vedic period they grew both uh, barley and rice so actually they mainly growed this rice that is rihi so correct option is neither one nor two so now let us try to see today's question the first one is regarding teachers of buddhism and second question is regarding mauryas so try to read these statements one and two in first question and try to read this four options in the second question and try to give me correct option in the comment box and now let us try to see newspaper pdf so before that here mains answer writing program which had been started today so from today at 10 o'clock onwards this course will be started so if you want to join this course so please contact us on this number 8074765513 okay so please contact us on this number for the queries regarding this course and for the registration and to start answer writing practice from today so please contact us on this number okay apart from that we are also ready to launch this pen drive courses for this foundation course of 2023 so if you want to join that course also you can contact me on this number and if you want to take individual courses like geography history economy like that you can also take the individual courses so now let us try to see today's hindu newspaper pdf let us very fast see the just titles of uh, articles so first one it is regarding the shebas nominated for pm post in pakistan so here you have to see this topic and next one it is regarding mix mix uh, price mix up march third dose rollout so it is talking about this precaution dose so what happened so there is a decreasing of the price of this covid shield and as well as uh, co uh, covaxin that is seen but number of uh, private hospitals they didn't gave their clarity and next one is modi biden to hold visit uh, summit today so it is talking about this 2 plus 2 dialogue so after once it is done we are going to see highlights of this article and if you move forward leave the city page there is nothing much article important here and you can also leave the state page education plus and here if you see this editorial i discussed this topic and i discussed this inflation topic also i discussed this care economy and there is an article i didn't discuss that is regarding education okay for example i can talk about a language here so what happens states speaking languages other than hindi they should be free to use this language uh, english as a link so actually this is not the new topic so it is happening from some decades onwards and i discussed about this national education policy in architecture so if you move forward i discussed this no conference vote in pakistan i discussed this topic of non place and there is one article that is bsf that is border security force team come in 15 kilometers to seize cattle so actually what happened especially this uh, border security force in punjab west bengal and assam so they are mainly guarding this uh, area and in, in this area there is one problem like cattle smuggling is happening so here this bsf they mainly uh, seized a truck which is mainly carrying nine buffaloes here and it is more than 15 kilometers from their outpost okay so you have to know about the central armed police forces in this regard so what is their mandate and this is about 2 plus 2 summit regarding this uh, us and india so in this uh, us uh, india 2 plus 2 meet they are going to talk about this ukraine crisis and they will be talking about defense related things science and technology climate public health supply chains so these are some important areas of concern 
and they are going to talk about these issues and once this is done there will be number of editorials that will be coming up uh, in our hindu so then we are going to discuss that don't worry about that so as of now you have to know what is this 2 plus 2 summit that is between foreign ministers and defense ministers of these two countries and there is one article regarding death penalty you can go through that death penalty article i discussed about this bengal coast and there is one article regarding us which is mainly imposing new terms in this iran's nuclear task nuclear talks so it is nothing but jcpo joint comprehensive uh, plan of action so this is very important from your international relations so these are some articles that appeared in this today's newspaper i hope you enjoyed this lecture so please subscribe to rathor science academy and don't forget to like share and comment my videos Thank you so much.